they are they're not allowed to comment on things that they can just talk like have a discussion on it. They would still have to go through Zoom. Oh, yeah. yeah, but if you can broadcast it through Facebook, mm -hmm. they are not allowed to comment on things that they can just talk like have a discussion on it. They would still have to go through Zoom. Oh, okay. Are we okay? <laughs> you say, wait, <laughs> I was trying to pull it back. Okay, we're good. Now we're good. All right, this time we're calling the special meeting of September 27th, 2021 to order. Council member Resendez, we lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? So the I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. Roll call, please. Council Member Perez? Here. Council Member Burns? Here. Vice Mayor Resendez? Present. Mayor Velasquez? Here. City Manager Miller? Here. Chief of Police Reynoso? Here. And the record will show City Attorney Epperson is absent. Thank you. Verification agenda posting. The agenda for the City of Hollister City Council special meeting of September 27th was posted on the bulletin board on September 24th, 2021 at 1 10 p.m. per government code section 54956. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move to item A1. Thank you, Mayor. So the Council will receive a presentation on the storm water, including regulations, requirements, storm system, and the MS4 permit. And we have Carrie Wegner from Wallace to do that, start that presentation off. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, staff. My name is Carrie Wagner. I'm with Wallace Group, and today we are going to do a workshop on all things stormwater. Uh, so I think we'll wait till the presentation is up. Rem remotes on. All right. All right. So as you know, Wallace Group has been working with the city for many years, over a decade now, uh, and doing your utility master plans, stormwater being one of the major elements. And we've been working with the city on many different facets of the stormwater uh, components within your system, including your infrastructure and the regulatory requirements. So today, um, we are going to do a presentation overview of uh, the storm drain system. We're gonna talk about the regulatory requirements, your MS4 stormwater program, uh, post-construction requirements, watershed plan, trash amendments, projects that are in, currently in design, the stormwater grant program, and the Greater Hollister Area Stormwater Resource Plan, which is actually the driving factor to why we are doing this workshop today. So a quick update on the storm drain system itself. Um, back uh, several years ago, Wallace Group com um, completed a two, uh, storm drain ma master plan. Uh, your system comp uh, is comprised of 59 plus miles of storm drain piping, various diameters, uh, 1200, over 1200 storm drain manholes, over 1800 storm drain inlets, eight drainage basins of which four of them are terminal basins and four are detention basins. Um, meaning the water comes in them, it will fill up and then it'll flow back out um, to uh, the river. And then you have 20 river outfalls, eight of them flow to the San Benito River and 12 of them flow to the Santa Ana Creek, all of which both of those are tributary to the Pajaro River downstream down into uh, um, goes down into Santa Cruz County, Monterey County. So what have we done today to work? What work has been completed today? Uh, in 2011, we did your storm drain master plan. We identified 19 capital improvement projects that had to do with stormwater. 
Uh, you can see a couple of the streets. Um, fortunately, back in 2011 was a very wet or 2010 was a very wet rain year. And so we actually were able to get several pictures of flooding areas, um, areas of concern. Um, they, the city has since then completed one of those projects, which was the Fourth Street Improvement Project, um, CIP 1609 and 1612. This was a road improvement project as well as it addressed uh, stormwater improvements. Glenn uh, Ryder has been working with the city uh, over the past few years. Um, assisting the city with the MS4 compliance. He unfortunately is out sick. So I'm going to attempt to, to uh, convey the MS4 stormwater permits, but I am not the expert on it. So please be gentle with me on this subject matter. So what is an MS4? It's Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, M with four S's. Uh, this is the conveyance or system of publicly owned storm drain gutters, roadside ditches, grassy swales, sediment ponds, and similar features. Um, as storm water flows over the land, it, can, it collects water, um, storm water, it, which also uh, collects a mixture of pollutants deposited by the landscape, natural and human activity. So you've got the oils, the greases from the cars, you've got fertilizers, you've got dog waste, so forth. All of that gets picked up in the storm water um, and that flows to your gutters, your drainage system and flows out to the creeks. These uh, systems provide essential drainage and stormwater management for urban and suburban areas and must uh, handle uh, fluctuating precipitation events, meaning you know, your stormwater system has got to be able to handle a wide variety of storm events over the years. So what is the background with an MS4 permit? This is something that's on the newer side for municipalities. Um, back in the early 2000s, the Clean Water Act uh, was a federal um, act that was enacted and it, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System for MS4s. Order uh, phase one is over 100,000. You guys are in phase two, which is 20,000 to 100,000 population. This enacted the construction general permit. Um, Subsequently, then this, which the California MS4, uh, MS4 general permit includes total maximum daily loads, the trash capture order and the regional order for the post construction requirements. Those orders have come subsequent to the early 2000s when the, when the California Water Act was enacted um, implementing the MS4 permits. Included in there is also the California construction general permit which is oftentimes you'll hear the construction based, the SWIPs, stormwater pollution prevention plans. So these are all regulations that the city as well as construction, either pre-construction, post-construction have to comply with um, as well as uh, the city operations. Um, so this is where we're all regulating different forms of stormwater before and after construction. By the way, if you guys have any questions as we're going, this is a workshop. It's meant to be interactive. Feel free to interrupt me, ask me questions. I'm happy to ask them as we're going through the workshop. Your MS4 system boundary. Uh, this is your city boundary. Uh, and what you're seeing is your city boundary and the various sub watersheds um, within, this, within the city. Um, all of these sub watersheds flow to an outfall of some sort um, and they go to the receiving water. So what is a receiving water? It's defined as a body of water, such as an ocean stream, river, pond, lake. Um, and it's defined is where storm water is discharged. This is where storm water runoff collects and concentrates pollutants to impair recreational function of receiving water bodies by causing harm to aquatic life and potentially to humans. So that storm water collects on your streets. It collects all those pollutants, the waste, the oils, the greases, everything collects into the storm water and it heads out to San Benito River where then it infiltrates into the ground when the river is running. It is included there, the aquatic life, everything is inhabited by or inhibited by the storm water, um, by those pollutants. And when you get large concentrations, that's when you start seeing aquatic life being um, harmed by these pollutants. It's something as a you know, society, we need to protect the environment. So Hollister has two 
uh, receiving waters, San Benito River and Santa Ana Creek. Those are the two rivers that we are most uh, that we are focused on at this time. So I've talked about total maximum daily loads, and there's a lot of words on this on here. Um, but basically what it is, is, is a list of constituents that we have to analyze that we monitor and there are total maximum daily load limits that can enter the stormwater that once we go above that, it becomes harmful. We've identified as being harmful to aquatic life. And so, uh, one of the largest, um, in each of the, or San Benito river and Santa Ana Creek, what you want to pull from this is the. Fecal coliform in the sediment um, have been identified as total maximum daily loads. The city has frequently surpassed the total maximum daily loads in uh, for fecal coliform and sediment, which means it's picking up waste um, and, and that is entering into the, the creeks and river. Um, and so the Regional Water Quality Control Board, which is the regulating body, has identified those as issues and uh, constituents of concern for the city. So what are the minimum requirements for the MS4 stormwater program? It comes in two parts. Um, the first part is uh, what we have to measure. Um, so we do planning, uh, we do implementation, and then we assess it. Uh, there are six components to the first program. The first part is public education. That's why we send out newsletters um, in your water bills and so forth. We put the information about trash capture, you in, uh, information about picking up your dog waste. This is all stemmed from these programs. Uh, public outreach, again, it's, it's, it's why we're having this workshop. It's the public education. The more you know and understand about how your trash impacts the water quality, the more likely you are to go and pick up that piece of trash when you're walking down the street and cleaning up the streets. Um, illicit discharge de detection and elimination. Um, we want to make sure that there are no illicit discharges, uh, wrongful discharges into our stormwater collection system, that we are monitoring those connections. Construction site stormwater controls. When a project is under construction, uh, we do not want sediment running off of those project sites and into your storm drain system. That sediment is a major polluter to the, to the river channels, um, as well as it's a maintenance nightmare to your, your operators because they have to clean that sediment. It ends up settling out in your pipes and it becomes and it clogs up your, your storm drain pipes. The post-construction site stormwater controls. Again, um, when you construct a project, that was once bare land, when, the, when it was bare land and stormwater hit that project site, the water would normally just stay on that site. It would infiltrate into the ground and percolate into the groundwater basin. When you develop it and you put houses, parking lots, all of this area, impermeable area, that now that stormwater hits all of that impermeable area and now has the ability to run off post-construction requirements, which Valerie is going to go a little bit more in depth on that in a little bit, a little bit later, it identifies how you have to maintain that stormwater on site to match pre-construction requirements. And then good housekeeping and pollution prevention. Um, this is on the city now. Uh, how does the city operate and maintain the, the storm drain collection system to, uh, provide good housekeeping and prevention. And that's creating operations and maintenance practices that uh, operators uh, and the city staff maintain. The part two of the MS4 stormwater program is quantification of the pollutant loads and estimation of pollutant load reductions achieved by the program as a whole. So now we have all of these six programs that are implemented. How do you actually identify whether or not they're working? So the city has a uh, program software. It's uh, run by Second Nature. It's a, it's a program where we have implemented and inputted all of your drainage information, all of your best management practices, the low impact development. Um, tell me if you don't understand some of these words that I'm throwing out there, but these are all stormwater improvements. We put them into a, a, a program that will identify what the loading is, how much it tells you how much land, how much bare land you might have, how much development you might have. And it 
identifies how much pollutant loading you might have going to a specific outfall. And then what we do is as the city is implementing new projects, we put those new projects into the program and it then tells us how much reduction we've had in a pollutant loading. So we know where the highest pollutant loaded areas are based on topography, based on um, bare ground, um, based on the urban urbanization of the, of the streets, um, many different factors that go into it. And then we identify and target what are the best management practices that we can implement either operationally or physical projects that we can do to put in and then we identify where and how we're going to reduce those pollutant loadings. So that's part two of the program. So what has the city done to date? Uh, first off, we have a GIS based storm drain model um, that has identified all of the watersheds uh, within the entire city. We've done a quantitative analysis using a scientifically defensible pollutant load analysis, the second nature program, and we've prioritized the priority areas for required municipal inspections. So we have to go out every so often and actually inspect those uh, detention basins, the physical facilities, full capture systems, whatever we might have, we have to actually physically go out and, and um, inspect those to make sure that they are living up to what their design parameters were. The city has um, prepared a TMDL WAP, um, which is a monitoring program um, that is has to be done. Um, the biggest thing is, is making sure that you do it after what we call the first flush. The first flush is the very first storm of a rainy season. That is the first storm that is going to carry the highest pollutant loading. You drive all summer long, all your cars are leaking oil, gas, everything, all the pollutants collect over the summer. That first storm is the one that's going to have the highest pollutant loading of the season. And so we call that the first flush. So that's the, that's the one that was most important to collect storm water and treat it. We have the illicit discharge and detection elimination plan. Um, we've uh, worked um, with compliance, you know, working with the city for compliance. We've identified standard operation protocols for the municipal construction site inspection. Um, so you have contractors who have come in, uh, making sure that the city understands the standard op operating procedures, the standard um, inspection requirements to ensure that they are meeting their construction general permit and installing the post-construction requirements, the stormwater requirements that are involved. Um, identified the long-term maintenance program tracking and inspection. Uh, the regional board is requiring that the city maintain the lists of all of these facilities or all of these facilities that are needed for stormwater improvements. And so it's creating that standard tracking process and implementing that. And then there is reporting, there's audits, audits by the, the regional board. The regional board will come out and actually do physical audits of your system, which they have in the past. Uh, we also have to do what we call a PAP. It's a program effectiveness, effectiveness assessment and improvement plan. So we can install these, these, uh, this infrastructure, but is it really doing what we expected it to do? So we have to go out and assess every year or so, so many years, we have to um, identify what that plan looks like to go out and assess to determine whether or not the program as is actually being effective. And then there's MS4 stormwater annual permits. Uh, so Wallace Group has been assisting the city in developing those annual permits or annual reports that we submit to the regional board. Are there any questions before we move on to the next subject matter on MS4 or the work that we've done with the city? Yes, Roland. Thank you. First of all, thanks for your presentation. It's very clear and concise and I'm following along with you. I really appreciate that. Um, I saw that in the beginning that you said there was 19 CIPs identified in 2011. There was only one of the 19 completed, if I'm understanding that correct. At, at this time, and at this time, only one CIP has been completed. Do we today. know why? Because it's 10 years ago. Why did we identify and we've only completed one of those? Probably a staff question. That is a yeah. staff question. Yeah, part of it is funding, and and then the other part is just getting it designed. But we're, we're working on tying those right now to some of the road projects so we get our best 
bang for the buck. Thank you. I do have a couple more. Um, fecal coliform, is that how you say it? Fecal coliform, yes. Okay. <laughs> it's increased for the city. Um, what and are and we... that's a normal, almost all cities have fecal coliform hits. So that's not unusual for the city. So, Okay. You talked about what you're doing with the increased pollutant areas. So I appreciate that. Um, and then I guess just, it's just so I can wrap my head around this. So after the water gets collected and it goes, how does, how do we treat it? We don't just, do we just, we collect it and then we let it go through the aquifers to the ground basin into the river. And then the river does the rest for yep. us. We don't actually treat it. So both of those Santa Ana river Creek and the San Benito river are both going to the Pajaro river. Correct. And that's what we do to treat stormwater. Well, is so so stormwater in general, and and you're going to learn a whole lot more about full capture systems. Sure. And one of and so one of the requirements um, that you're going to learn here just shortly is going to be about full capture systems. So the regional board has, you know, established that most agencies collect the storm water, it goes into your storm drain system, it goes out your outfalls, and it goes into the receiving waters. No treatment has been completed whatsoever. And so that is the whole purpose of these stormwater improvement projects, the, the um, trash capture amendment that is, is going to be talked about here shortly, um, that is to assist in cleaning up the debris, the chemicals, the stuff that is in stormwater before it hits the river, the outfalls, um, so we can help protect the, the habitat better. Okay. Thank you so much. Those are my questions. So some of this is going to get further answered for you here in, in a little bit. Did you have? Okay. Every time I think. Yeah, every time. Oh, sorry, I... Tim, you have a question, correct? Okay. Uh, yes, Mayor, I do. Go ahead, sir. Um, actually, I have a, a a few, and so maybe it'll be covered in the presentation as we move forward. But um, and I'm I'm more than happy to accept that as a response. So um, I want to talk a little bit more about what Vice Mayor Resendez brought up. And, and, and I, I, again, I don't understand the technical term, but I'm going to use the term fecal overload or uh, uh, more than we are allowed to deposit. So I heard you say that uh, we're dealing with that with education, but um, can you speak more specifically to what that looks like? And um, are there potential consequences if we don't uh, resolve that? And I'll, that's my first of probably four or five questions, please. Sure. So fecal coliform, um, you know, that is runoff from fecal matter, which is most commonly, you know, dog waste, uh, which is, you know, what is found around the streets and so forth. Um, we're seeing a rise on it in homeless populations as well um, as, as homeless encampments and so forth. Uh, rise, you're going to start getting more and more uh, fecal coliform hits from that uh, perspective. So just as a, you know, precaution that is coming up in other cities. Um, but for the most part in the city of Hollister, it is due to uh, animal waste. Um, so the public education, I don't specifically know, and maybe Mr. Miller couldn't um, uh, chime in a little bit more specifically on what the city has done. Um, but that's where public education is the best policy is informing people and encouraging people to use dog bag waste and properly throw them away because picking up your dog waste and then just leaving it on the sidewalk for someone else to pick it up at another time doesn't do us any good. You want to throw it away, deposit it at the uh, proper trash uh, receptacle. Um, but having it so cleaning up after animal is is essential. Um, is there a specific yeah, mainly the, providing the dog bags at the parks and then also just putting information in our, in our water bills. I'm wondering if there would be a way maybe through our police department, through our animal control people to maybe do some public service announcements or um, some sort of uh, announcements to our community. I mean, uh, even on social media platforms, because this is the first I've heard of this. And, and based on what I've heard said, if it's predictable, it should be preventable. And now that I've heard it, I, I got to believe a lot of it could be predictable. And, and I certainly don't want to see us in a, in a fine or a notice of violation circumstance for something like this. So my, um, my next question would be, actually, uh, 
Can I interrupt you with one other yeah. thing? The sure. other, the other um, it, it bird, you know, bird waste is also another, and that's not something that you can control. Um, but other ways is street sweeping. Um, street sweeping is a, you know, is one of the preventative uh, ways to control trash and clean up other debris and so forth. So um, that is another, uh, that's a staff operations. It's not necessarily public education. Right. And, and so uh, thank you. That's a great idea. I know that in the past we we'd had earlier conversations during my time on council about acquiring a second sweeper, but that was never brought up. And so um, uh, for our city manager and staff, I would be interested in seeing what that may look like. And if, if, you know, last time I recall, I think that street sweeper was about a quarter million dollars, but there may be a solid argument for a second sweeper. I know originally it was to deal with one that was aging and uh, breaking down regularly, but thank you. I think that's a great idea. And I'd like to hear more uh, about that maybe from our staff. I want to ask you about ponding basins. I heard you say that there are four ponding basins within the city. Um, and I believe I know where at least two or three are, but can you confirm where they are for me and talk about what the value is and, and, and the, the need? Because oftentimes when I see those, they, they, they just seem to be a waste of land to me. And I know that's not the case, but I'd like to know more about ponding basins and, and what your thoughts are. Sure. You have four basins um, and I'll have to uh, probably call, call in Valerie, who is on Zoom to tell me uh, exactly, or Henry, Henry can probably uh, identify where the exact locations of those are. Um, detention basins are uh, necessary on the stormwater side. Uh, so specifically when it comes to post-construction requirements, which we're going to talk a lot more about, uh, there is a need to maintain, um, uh, meet the hundred year flood requirements. We've, we've got to detain it on site. So there's a difference between a detention and a retention basin or a terminal basin. So we've got terminal, two terminal basins where the stormwater goes in um, and the stormwater does not come out. It stays in that basin, it percolates into the ground and it goes, it goes down. We've got uh, two non-terminal basins that the stormwater will go in. If it's on a low storm, those basins, that, that water will continue to percolate into the ground. If the stormwater, say, let's just say it's a hundred year storm event, it will overflow. It will get to a certain elevation where it'll go into an outfall pipe. And then that pipe will then outfall to the storm drain system and then continue on to the, the rivers. Um, and so you've got four of those. Now, when we talk about um, post-construction requirements, and we're going to talk about the industrial wastewater treatment plant project and the benefits of that project, and the watershed plan, one of the requirements when you have storm water for post-construction now is that they have to meet through the four different PCRs um, of which they've got to detain and on site, they have to match the pre and post-construction requirements. They've also got to maintain a certain amount of storm water on site. Well, this is key. The only, a lot of the only ways that they can do that is through either a detention basin or underground infiltration basins. And so we're seeing more and more of these as you get more and more development because they've got to retain the water on site. And Valerie is gonna talk a little bit more about that in detail about that um, discussion matter. Um, they are maintenance projects, you know, maintenance for the city, um, but they are a requirement by the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Okay, and part of your comment actually leads to uh, another question I have. So how does our, our future approved and future potential new development impact and or will it require us to alter this plan? Uh, I'm, I, I'm not sure I follow the question. Can you repeat it again? Yes. So how does our approved new development projects that are already approved uh, potentially impact the plan that we're talking about tonight and or how will the approved and potentially new plans alter this plan or force us to alter the plan? So the, 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 we, we're going to be talking about the watershed plan. We're going to be talking about post-construction requirements. We're going to be talking about the stormwater resource plan here shortly. 
all of these plans understand and relate the post-construction requirements. The post-construction requirements have been in place since 2013. So we have been planning for the post-construction requirements for years now. Um, so all new development is already following these requirements and we've accounted for it. Okay. And so my understanding is the governor has just signed some legislation that's going to put a heavier burden on the city to, to build more housing. Um, I doubt that you could have factored that into the plan, not knowing that that was going to happen, but will that require some additions to the plan as we move forward and, and figure out how we as a city are going to uh, address those issues? No, that is going to be on the engineer of the, uh, the and the developer. Um, the developer has to handle all stormwater compliance on site. So as they are thinking through their development project, they are going to have to understand how it's going to, how stormwater is impacted, what their lot of their size, what their size lot is, how much impermeable land they're going to have. It's going to then drive the calculations to determine what kind of stormwater compliance it's going to be, um, whether or not it's a detention basin and how it's impacted. The watershed plan is going to help potentially with some future development on the Santa, uh, San Benito River side of it. Um, but that is really, it's an engineering problem um, and it's being accounted for. All development has to account for it this time. Okay. And, and so I presume that the County of San Benito also has uh, the plans that we're talking about tonight. And I'm curious how their plan and our plan uh, work in harmony and where there may be some conflict or some need for a broader, bigger countywide conversation. Sure. Um, so the County is actually not under an MS4 permit. Um, that is the biggest difference between the County and the city project. Um, the city has to follow the MS4 permit, which means they have post-construction requirements. They have to follow the trash compliance. The county does not. The county only has to follow the construction general permit, which is not as intense as the PCRs. Um, and so any project that falls in the county follows the county general permit and not, or construction permit, sorry, the, the, the county, or the general construction permit. Um, and, and so that is where there has been some, some issues, um, in when those projects come in and if they do flow into the city and the city then has to deal with it. So that is something that I'm working on with the County and understanding that relationship and, and knowing that, that if their stormwater flows into the city, it needs to follow PCRs as well. And have you gotten some cooperation and do they understand that position and, um, um, maybe a broader conversation for council and staff at another time, but a consequence if they disregard that or there are uh, issues that could have been prevented? That is so, you know, the administration at the, at the staff level has changed significantly over this last year. Um, I am working with them. Um, it is still, they are not under a regulatory compliance to follow the MS4 permit and the post construction requirements. So it is, it is definitely something that needs to be worked on and collaborated between the city and the county. Um, but yes, I am working with them hand in hand on, a, on many projects. Okay, thanks. Does um, Fish, the Department of Fish and Wildlife have a role in this process at all or any say so? Uh, not really. Not, the, the regulatory compliance um, is all from the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Um, fish and wildlife is going to have a play if, um, I'm sure they, they discussed or they had, um, comments on the post-construction requirements. Obviously they benefit from the post-construction requirements as it helps benefit the, the rivers and our streams. Um, but they do not have a direct regulatory, uh, connection to it. Okay. Thanks. And I guess my final question, and you touched on this a little bit too, and maybe you'll explore or explain it a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to use lay terms that I'm familiar with. Um, uh, you, you mentioned something about a hundred year storm plan. And so I was hoping that maybe you could talk a little bit more either now or at some point in the presentation regarding that. Sure. Um, when I refer to a hundred year storm on the hydrology side, we, uh, when you get a certain size storm, meaning a one inch storm over a 24 hour period or a five inch storm over a 25, 24 hour period, um, the 
each storm is classified by a one-year storm, a two-year storm. It's basically the predictability of how intense that storm is over a certain duration of time. So a one-year storm is a storm that you would see once you would see once a year. Um, so we get many of those. So your storm drain system is sized. I believe your storm drain system is sized for 10 year or 25, 25 year storm. So your storm drain system is physically sized. And what we size the, in the storm drain master plan is we sized your storm drain system to be able to handle a 25 year storm. That is a typical storm that a, a municipality, um, would need to, to maintain. What happens though, when you have a hundred year storm, that means that's your storm of all storms that we, and there are starting to evaluate really 200 year storms as well. These are the storms that really can come in and, you know, inundate your infrastructure. What happens in your city when you have a hundred year storm event? We can't build the infrastructure underground to convey a hundred year storm. That is just cost you know, it, it is cost prohibitive. We cannot do that, but we have to have the street capacity to be able to convey the water so that we are not flooding buildings, which is the costly uh, component of a storm event. We don't want to, you know, raise up our streams, our Creek beds so high, so fast. There's gotta be capacity in the channel. So if you know anything about FEMA, FEMA produces on the San Benito River, the Santa Ana Creek, it's going to have the hundred year floodplain. You cannot build infrastructure of any uh, significance in a hundred year floodplain. You can have parks and miscellaneous recreational facilities in there. And that is because those river channels have to have capacity for the hundred year storm event. Your roads need to be able to convey the hundred year storm event off so that you're not flooding out a house. When you build a property, their property, their house, their, their uh, pad elevation needs to be a hundred above the hundred year floodplain. So these are things as engineers that we look at when we are designing a stormwater infrastructure and your development. So when we do plan checks for your developments, we check that hydrology to in the hydraulics of your collection system to make sure that that water can be conveyed, that there's not a low point, that there's not a sump. Um, and so you saw in one of those pictures, you saw a sump, there's a sump at fourth street. It's where the water puddles and it can't go anywhere. Those are problems. Those are the things that we're trying to fix as part of those CIPs in the capital in the storm drain master plan. Thank you for your answers. I, I appreciate it very much. It's very helpful. Mayor, thank you. That, that's my questions for now. Let me, let me if you, maybe you could help um, visually. The storms of 96, 97, what did they rate at? 96 and 97. Um, Where we had a lot of rain and the uh, river was did. knocking down some bridges. Do you know what that was rated? Let me see if I can look it up while we're doing that and I can get back to you. Thank you. Valerie, if you're listening, maybe you can look it up and text it to me. <laughs> or when she gets on here shortly, she might know the answer. Any other questions? All right, moving on. So Valerie is gonna now talk about post-construction requirements. Go ahead, Valerie. Oh. She's still muted. Good evening. Want to confirm that, that everybody can hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, excellent. Thank you. And, and thank you, Carrie, for the introduction. So tonight I will be talking about the post-construction requirements, otherwise known as the PCRs. And these are requirements that were developed by the regional board with the goal of reducing pollution that reaches our waterways and also minimizing erosion and other impacts to the creeks and streams. And these PCRs are required through your MS4 stormwater permit that Carrie was describing. Next slide, please. So first I'll go through a, a brief overview of what the post-construction requirements are. And they are a set of four different tiers which each have a different level of care for stormwater. And they, the tier system is based on the amount of impervious surface that a project will create. 
and this is new or replaced impervious, which is important to understand because these requirements also apply to redevelopment projects. There are some exemptions for maintenance, such as repaving or overlaying an existing roadway. So tier one is called site design and runoff reduction. And tier one requires that you include some form of low impact development in your project. And that means trying to hold water on your site through directing runoff to a landscaped area or possibly including what could be called a rain garden, a low lying area on your site that would hold stormwater and not allow it to run off. Tier two is water quality treatment. And the regional board has identified a specific storm for which you have to treat all the runoff. And this can be done in a landscape based feature like a, some type of vegetated swale, which would be considered low impact development. That's what's preferred by the regional board or water quality treatment can be achieved in more of a mechanical means, which would be some type of filter system that would generally be placed underground in connection to your storm drain system. Tier three is retention, and this is where you're holding water, holding stormwater runoff on your project site. And the retention volume, the amount of runoff you would have to hold is higher than the volume for water quality treatment. It's about twice the volume. So as you're going up in these tiers, you're also talking about managing larger volumes and larger rates of runoff. Tier four is what's called peak flow management and Carrie spoke to this a little bit as well. This is where we would be trying to match a pre-development runoff condition. So in general, when you place impervious surfaces over the ground, you tend to increase the volume and the flow rate of runoff that's coming off of that land. And under tier four, you have to hold some of that water back and meter it out slowly so that you're matching the existing conditions for peak flow. And it's important to understand with these tiers that the tiers are cumulative. So for example, if a project is large enough that it falls under tier four, which most housing developments would fall under this tier, you also have to meet tiers three, two, and one. Next slide, please. So the city has identified and understands that implementation meeting these PCRs on each project site can be a challenge. And it's especially a challenge for project sites that have a more dense clay type soil to try to hold a lot of water on their project site. And so working with the city, we have been developing what's called a watershed plan. And that plan is specific for an alternative compliance for the post-construction requirements. So the PCRs are intended to be implemented on each project site. By having a regional program, such as a watershed plan, the PCRs can be met in a regional facility, such as a larger basin. And this has benefits for both the city and the community. Primarily for the city, what this will do is it will reduce the time and effort and complexity of your operations and maintenance program. Because as Carrie mentioned, for every stormwater facility that's constructed to comply with the PCRs, the city is now required to track the operations and maintenance and make sure that those facilities are maintained. And that has to be done at minimum on a yearly basis. And that needs to be um, reported back to the regional board as a part of your MS4 permit. So as more developments are, are, uh, are installing these types of facilities on each project site, that's increasing the number of facilities that need to be tracked and potentially managed by the city. If you can, rather than have these basins or swales or other features on each project site and 
accomplish that PCR requirement in a larger facility, you have fewer facilities to maintain. The watershed plan would also bring along an in lieu fee program, meaning that if a development chose to use alternative compliance or rather than having stormwater facilities on their site, they would use a regional facility, then they would pay an in lieu fee that would correspond to the amount of impervious surface on their project site. So that in lieu fee program would pay for the installation and the ongoing operations and maintenance of these regional facilities. And the in lieu fee program also provides an avenue to generate funding for some of the CIP projects that were identified in the storm drain master plan that also benefit the alternative compliance through the watershed plan. One of the larger benefits for the community as a whole is that by implementing this watershed plan, the stormwater quality specifically in San Benito River will be improved as compared to implementing the PCRs on each individual site. And that is because the watershed plan is proposing to capture existing runoff runoff that drains right now to the San Benito River and infiltrate and treat that water prior to it reaching the river. And so we're taking runoff from developments that occurred prior to these PCRs that were not required to provide treatment or retention on site. And now we're cleaning it up before it gets to the river. And it's important to note that the city also has made a commitment to the Hollister Farms development for alternative compliance through this watershed plan. So we have at least one project that has been identified that the city has already allowed to um, follow that alternative compliance option. Next slide, please. So what the watershed plan is proposing is that as I described, we would be diverting water that currently flows or runoff, I should say, that currently flows to the San Benito River. And so the watershed plan would apply to any development that would occur within a watershed that drains to the San Benito River. And that diversion would occur by sending runoff to the existing industrial wastewater treatment plant, which is shown there on the left. And so the watershed plan proposes that pond two, which is an existing retention pond, would capture stormwater runoff. And then if needed, that stormwater runoff would be pumped to the existing percolation ponds and then percolate into the groundwater before reaching the river. Now the primary diversion would occur at what at your existing storm drain outflow that currently discharges near Apricot Lane. Apricot Lane, the Apricot Lane outfall is just on the south side of Pond 2. And the primary diversion would be sending the runoff from that outfall to Pond 2 instead of the river. And we've also identified a few upstream locations where we could divert even more runoff through that Apricot Lane outfall. And one of the things to note about the watershed plan is it includes multiple projects that the city can choose to implement over time if they have enough interest from the development community to follow this alternative compliance plan. So it's multiple projects. They don't all have to be constructed. They can be constructed as development occurs and as it is needed. It's also important to note that the watershed plan projects would also benefit any city capital improvement projects that might trigger the post construction requirements. So as an example, some roadway improvements like curb and gutter replacement or curb ramp replacement, even sidewalk replacement, can trigger the post construction requirements. And those can be very challenging to try to fit in now new stormwater facilities within a right of way that may already be built out. And so in that case, 
the city will also really benefit from having this means of compliance because rather than trying to fit new stormwater facilities within your right of way, you can use alternative compliance through this new facility at the industrial treatment plant. And I'm ready for the next slide, thank you. So there are some programmatic requirements through the regional board that would come along with the watershed plan. First would be an alternative compliance ordinance. This would be a, a new section in your municipal code that would outline the requirements that developers would have to follow in order to um, use this alternative compliance program. Second would be the in lieu fee program. So this in lieu fee program would need to be developed and also codified that would um, specify what a developer will need to pay in order to use alternative compliance. There's also compliance tracking. So just like the city is required by the regional board to track operations and maintenance of PCR facilities, you also need to track how you are managing compliance if developers are choosing this alternative route. The city will also need to identify O&M procedures for any facilities that are used under this alternative compliance program, primarily the industrial wastewater treatment plant. So by using the industrial plant for PCR compliance, now the regional board has the authority to request O&M documentation for that facility, and that's important to understand. The regional board has also requested that the city commit to tracking ongoing performance of any stormwater basin that would be included in this regional plan, such as the rustic street basin, which is pictured here on this slide. So the city would commit to over time tracking the infiltration in that basin to show to the regional board that it is in fact performing the way that it should be. And next slide, please. So where are we with the development of the watershed plan? We submitted a draft, our first draft to the regional board um, back in 2015. And we have gone through a number of um, round of comments with them back and forth. And we are at a point to where the regional board has stated that with some minor revisions, they are ready to approve the plan. It's undergoing final city review right now for submittal to the regional board. And after that watershed plan is approved, the, the next steps would be development of the in lieu fee program, updates to the city's municipal code, and also developing and finalizing tracking procedures for how the city is going to manage and, and uh, demonstrate to the regional board which projects fall under this alternative compliance option. And I'm gonna talk briefly also about the trash amendments and then I'll stop for questions after I get through this section. So similar to the post-construction requirements, the trash amendment is a requirement through the MS4 permit program. And the purpose of the trash amendment is to try to prevent trash and debris from entering a storm drain system. And the state water board developed the trash amendment and now the city is in charge of implementing the trash amendment. And let's go ahead to the next slide. So in 2018, Wallace Group worked with the city to develop a, a, a compliance memo for the trash amendment to identify the path forward. The city at that time chose what's called a full, a full trash capture system. And the intention is that a trash capture, capture system would be installed at all of the major outfalls to either the San Benito River or Santa Ana Creek. 
the just of note is that the bridge road is the largest outfall and that's the that's the most northern outfall to the San Benito River. And what a full capture system is, is a mechanical device that would capture all particles five millimeters or greater. So that's really small. And so we're talking about down to the sediment level. And so here we're treating water for not only the large debris, bottles and trash and leaves, but also some smaller particles that may have entered that stormwater system. And these Full capture systems are sized for the first flush storm, which Carrie had described. This is typically um, analyzed as a one year, one hour storm. And this is a typical storm that you might see during the beginning of the rainy season that would mobilize all these pollutants that have been collecting um, in the storm drain system and in the right of way. Next slide, please. Great. And so that's the end of my discussion specific to the PCRs and the trash amendment. And I'm happy to take any questions that you might have before Carrie jumps in to some more detailed discussion on, on where we are in design of some of these projects. Is there any questions from anyone? Uh, Council member Resendez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I do have a couple quick questions. So um, in regards to the watershed plan, um, are there any more cons or downsides? I saw, I saw you talk about a lot of the pros and then you did talk about say, some um, programmatic requirements, but are there any other cons or downsides aside from what you touched as far as the programmatic requirements? Sure, so the, the one con um, I think that's really specific for the city is that the first project that we propose to implement for the watershed plan is the diversion of that apricot lane outfall. And that's a sizable project that diverts a sizable volume of stormwater. So there is some potential that we move forward with the watershed plan, we divert all that water, and then really there's maybe not a lot of buy-in from the development community that wants to use that alternative compliance um, option. So there is some potential that your in-lieu fees, you know, may not generate as much as we would like them to. And I think Carrie can talk a little bit more specifically when she gets into her section about where that project is in design and how it relates to some other stormwater requirements for the city. Um, but in terms of cons, that, I mean, that's that would be the biggest one is that you have to take a, a leap of faith per se to construct one of these projects, assuming you have one or two developers that want to buy in, and then you're counting on future developments to continue to pay those in lieu fees. Thank you. Mr. Burns, did you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I think I'll hold my questions for later. Thank you. I Just do. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Price. Uh, so my, my questions were on the full capture system. The, um, how big are these? I mean, because I'm sure, I don't know if you guys seen the, the Fourth Street Bridge area. It is a lot of trash. And it's, I, it's, it's crazy. We will actually talk about that one specifically here in just a little bit. So hold that question. Awesome. Well, darn it. Because <laughs> you keep answering questions when I, after I write them down. The, uh, all right. So... Yeah, you're, you will answer my questions. I will answer that question. I do have a comment. I, I'm not really in favor of the in lieu fee program. I think that Hollister Farms is a good example of what can go wrong for us on that type of a project. I think we're seeing now all these different ways to handle this. I think there was a one of your pictures. I think one of the newer developments had some along their uh, roadway, a, uh, a catch basin landscaping i think it's cobalt maybe um you see a lot of these really good designs out there that are pretty and it, it landscapes and it's one of the things we talked about a while back of let's push the sound walls back so we can do all these things we can have a bikeway and we can um, have the landscaping and handle these uh areas basic retention ponds but they look beautiful it, it it's more natural rather than let's just find a way for a developer to get more land built on it 
it doesn't really make sense anymore. And I think it's important that we, we look at ways to do this without saying, well, let's, okay, developer, we're going to find you a way to get more land to build on instead of let's make our community prettier a than what it is. Absolutely. Um, that is that you're absolutely some, the engineers are being very innovative, very creative on how to, um, uh, create a different, different environment to allow for these water quality features and stuff. The water, the, the, the primary focus of the watershed plan was not because of that. Cause remember the watershed plan only, uh, assists in PCR three and PCR four, depending on where you are in the site. So PCR one and two still have to be treated on site, which is the water quality and the, you know, small storms. The difference is, is that some of your sites specifically on the San Benito Riverside fall on clay layers of which do not percolate and engineers are having to create basins. They are having to go down actually the site that's just to the right of that lowest pond. Uh, I can't remember the development of name of that one, that project Apricot, yeah had significant engineering challenges when it came to their percolation basins, meaning they had to install dry wells that were 25, 30 feet deep before they got below a clay layer where they could eventually percolate the water into the ground. And they had to backfill those. Well, then what happens to those over time? Sediment fills up, they no longer work appropriately, they're challenging, they become a long-term operations and maintenance issue. So the watershed plan is not necessarily meant for those projects that are um, can do it on site, they can create opportunities on site that are pretty, you know, they can create parks, they can create open space, um, do that kind of infrastructure if they have the right planning. But sometimes projects are just technically infeasible and you cannot build the infrastructure that is required from the PCR requirements. And this goes to show also like what Valerie had said, you may have a city municipal project that will trigger the PCRs that you cannot comply with the PCRs because of land right of way acquisition, whatever it might be, and it will trigger the PCRs and you're not going to be able to comply. This watershed plan provides you an opportunity to do an in lieu process that will allow you to, you know, do an alternate process that will still allow you to meet the PCRs in a different way. And that kind of is going to my whole point. Some areas shouldn't be developed. And that's really, instead of forcing it, it's like, well, it can't happen here for these reasons. We talked earlier, uh, the county issue. Developers like going to the county because it's much cheaper to build there. So the county turns around and says, come on over, build. And then the city down the line suffers the consequences from it. That's why all this plan is so important. But it's if there's an area that just really can't absorb that, uh, actually, a lot of that area was farmland. So sometimes you don't want to change what's there because it makes more sense to keep it the way it is rather than just saying, well, no, we doesn't matter. We want to build 100 houses here and here, go build something down the road and we'll send it to you. One way or another, at the end, taxpayers, we pay for it and we lose um, valuable land just to build more houses that shouldn't be built there. So planning is very important. I would definitely want to be seeing proposals or projects, definitely the ones in the future, that understand that and retain it all within the property. And again, when it's done right, it becomes a beautiful project rather than just squeeze everything in and let's get every inch we can. We've seen some new projects that got approved that there literally is two to three feet between the uh, sidewalk to the sound wall. It looks more like a prison wall. So these are things we should never be doing. That's why I'm in lieu of always turns out to be, we end up paying down the road big time. And that's what I've seen in the past. So I'd like to, I love some of the designs and I want to see more of that, yeah. that conversation. And the city's oftentimes in a, you know, in a rock between the hard place is, you know, they're having to force an affordable housing. Um, the developers are trying to, you know, you trying to meet your affordable housing, you're trying to meet open space requirements, all of that. So it is a balancing act. It's definitely where I would uh, recommend that the city work with the developers to understand that what your future goals of the city and the vision of the city are, uh, are, 
Um, the watershed plan is at a point where you guys, where we would love to have to make sure that the city is endorsing it because it is a plan. It's not one that you have to implement every single project. It's available. The regional board is supporting it. You do need it for Hollister Farms. You all are aware of the notice of violation that the city has received. We have to implement that project to meet the Hollister Farm requirements. So there's, there's, so this is the plan that's, uh, that's helping us to get out of the notice of violation with four Hollister farms. Let me finish real quick. And I'll go back to Hollister farms because okay. that is one project. I can remember this conversation about, well, our, our goal, our plan is to just take all the water and run it to the ponds. And so why don't they do like everybody else? Let it percolate there at, at, on site. Oh no, this would make more sense. That's a great example of what we should never do again, never. And I was frustrated because I kept pointing out some of these problems, potential problems, and it was, oh, don't worry about it. This will all work out. And of course the boat went through and it, it happened, but it came back and really bit us pretty hard. And the developer was willing to do all the things that were necessary originally, but because we chose to find a different way to do it for some, crazy reason we as a community are paying for it now and i want to make sure anything we do we don't come back to the community later and say well sorry we, we're going to have to take more money now from the general fund or from whatever fund to do something because we allowed a developer to not do something and that's my point is i understand we have to do this for hollister farms but and i get we have to get this thing approved what i'm saying is our focus should really be on any new construction, making sure it's all right there. So we're not overloading the system in the future. Cause that's, and again, I, <laughs> Henry knows this. I've been talking about infrastructure for years and years here about the impacts of every single development, what it has on the pipes. Yeah. And I know pipes are underground, so people don't see them, but there's an impact. Every foot costs money to maintain. And we need to make sure we don't stress the system out more because anything else we build over here is going to require a larger pipe over here and that's when we have to pay the big dollars and i'm happy that we're finally doing a plan and doing infrastructure as was pointed out all these years it never happened and now we're at that point but i want to make sure that our, i get again that we have to do what we're doing yeah. but i want to make sure that in my opinion that focus has to be on these different ways now and not hoping for a system to make it easier for a developer down the road that just does not sit well for me any longer. And one of the things that I would like to clarify is, and we're just about to talk about it, is the industrial wastewater treatment plant project and how that vision was started and how the watershed plan was started. It was started by an environmental reason to meet the trash capture uh, requirements, the existing city infrastructure it was the, the requirements to get the pollutants off the roads from existing development, not future development. With that, we then tied, there's a nexus between obviously existing development, future development. There was an opportunity to develop the alternative compliance that could provide opportunities to help support development if needed and support city projects if needed by bringing and allowing stormwater to be uh, treated at the industrial wastewater project. So as we go through these projects, these are all projects that the city is being required to do because of the MS4 permit, not because of the watershed plan. It's the watershed plan that is, is a, a, a tool that is being followed behind to help support development and alternative compliance in the future, um, and to also help support uh, operations and maintenance. So just trying to wanting to make sure that it was not, the, the watershed plan did not Development did not drive necessarily the, the, this whole process. It was the regulatory requirements and the MS4 permit that is driving what all of these projects are coming up. Did you Mr. Resendez, you had a comment? Yeah, just real quick. I'm just wondering, uh, the mayor brought up a good point about what the ground looks like. I'm just wondering if we have a map or do we have any visual that we can refer to as far as like where these trouble areas are, where there's clay and then you're not able to percolate the water as opposed to where the water is a, a able to be percolated. Do we have that for the city of Hollister at all? Is that something yes. we can do? Yes. Um, there are hydro hydrogeologists that we have geology maps um, that show the, the predominant um, soil types under the ground throughout the entire city of Hollister. 
Um, and those are the locations where, you know, th that ground may be not as permeable as other areas. I just think that's good to have. When it's it's readily available. Okay. Maybe we can get a copy of that. That might be useful. Sure. Thank you so much, Carrie. Appreciate it. Any other questions before we move on? All right. So we're going to talk now about what stormwater projects are actually in design right now. Uh, so we've talked a lot about upgrades to the industrial wastewater treatment plant. I know I've worked with the city council for several years now. We've had um, uh, issues and discussions about San Benito Foods and the industrial wastewater treatment plant project. Okay. So let me just give a little bit of background on the industrial wastewater treatment plant for anybody who might not know the facility. Pond one, uh, as labeled in this picture, is exclusively used at this time for wastewater treatment by San Benito Foods. The city has been working over the last couple of years with an agreement with San Benito Foods. They are now the sole operator of that facility. The city is no longer operating and maintaining that pond. They operate it during the, the they operate pond one year round. They treat wastewater only during the summer months, June through end of October. And almost <laughs> coming up. As of today, actually. As of today. They finished okay. finish today? Uh, Maybe. <laughs> um, so once they finish their canning season, then they continue to operate and maintain pond one, but they no longer then discharge. They, during the summer, are allowed to discharge their effluent to ponds three, four, five, and six. Those are your percolation basins. During the winter season, we are now, before, prior to this past year, Pond one used to overflow into pond two. Pond two would then pump to ponds three, four, five, and six. We cut off, we bifurcated ponds one and two. We said, San Benito Foods, you are only using pond one. They have made improvements to pond one to allow for proper treatment of their effluent wastewater. The city is now retaining pond two for stormwater capture. That pond two, we have gone through, we have desludged it. We are in the final throes of that project. We are getting it prepped and ready for the diversion project. The industrial wastewater treatment plant upgrades includes a full capture system, which you just heard, at the apricot outfall, which is located at the southeast corner of that pond too. It is also going to include a diversion structure. So basically we are gonna send it through a full capture system. We are then gonna send it through a diversion. It's going to go into pond two. Pond two is going to fill up if it gets, and then we are going to then pump that water out to the perk beds three, four, five, and six. During large storms, because we can only hold so much water in pond two, we cannot hold a hundred year storm. During the large storms, that water will outflow and flow back to San Benito River. Those are not the storms that we need to retain on site. We are only required by the PCRs and by the trash amendments to collect and treat certain size storms. So those storms will stay in the pond. The larger storms will overflow and go out to San Benito River. We have improvements to some of the overflows between ponds three, four, five, and six to make sure that the water is being spread appropriately and that it's being percolated into the ground. We are also doing an upgrade at um, the end of South Street. Um, did I, I think that's right. Okay, <laughs> I, just, I totally just blanked on the street. At South Street, where that line, the line coming down South Street is a combination sewer line for San Benito Foods, as well as a storm drain. So during the winter, it's a stormwater line. During the summer, it's a wastewater line. That line, we are now going to put a diversion structure so that uh, stormwater during the winter is going to flow directly to Pond 3. Um, so that the storm water goes to pond three, it does not go to pond one where it infiltrates uh, San Benito Foods' pond system. So those projects are being implemented. We are in, we're at 90% design. We're hoping to go out to bid by the end of the year. Um, and uh, obviously we will bring that project back to city council for approval to go out to bid. Real quick, Terry. Sure. So per Sunny Slope, they are wrapping up uh, this week for San Benito uh, Foods. Thank you. If you can go back real quick sure. there. Currently, or the, the way it was working before for the uh, winter season on South Street, that was going to which pond? It, it was going to Pond 1. It was going to Pond yes. 1. Yes. All stormwater going into South Street would go to Pond 1. It would get treated 
pump to pond or float to pond two, and then uh, out to ponds three, four, five, and six. Percolated from there. Percolated from there. So is pond two now a percolation pond? No, it'll remain a a, a non percolate. It'll remain a detention basin. Um, and then we will pump to ponds three, four, Why five. Why not and make that a percolation pond? Because of the hydrology underneath the flow of the gradient of the flow of the water flows under pond one, and we cannot compromise pond one. Um, so we do not want to inundate the flow underneath pond one. Plus you have an embankment to the east um, of with the development and without significant hydrogeology studies and geotechnical studies, we did not want to uh, potentially impact the ground, you know, impact uh, infrastructure that was already there. So two will go to three. Two will get pumped to three or four or five or six. Thank you. So this project is currently in design. Um, Andrea is going to come up and she's going to talk about the stormwater resource plan and the prop one grant that we are also in the process of doing. All righty. Thank you, Mayor, Council members. Um, so to wrap up this workshop, I will be going over the stormwater grant program and the recent application that the city applied for um, and the subsequent work that was required based on that uh, grant program. So the stormwater grant program is through the California State Water Resources Control Board. Uh, its primary mission is to promote beneficial use of stormwater and dry weather, dry weather runoff uh, in California. And it does this by providing financial assistance uh, through funding available through Prop 1, which was Assembly Bill 1471, authored by Rendon. That authorized $7.5 billion uh, in water projects. And of that total, $200 million in grant funds were allocated for multiple benefit stormwater management projects. Um, so last year, Round two of the Prop 1 grant funding was available for project applicants. In July of 2020, the city of Hollister applied for this grant funding um, and the industrial wastewater treatment plant upgrades that Carrie was just describing were used as matching funds of 4.7 million. And the trash capture project uh, for Bridge Road, which to, to reinstate, that's the largest watershed to the San Benito River that was used as the grant fund. Um, and earlier this year, the, um, the list of projects that were selected were published. Uh, unfortunately, the city was not on that list, but we had discussions with the state. They said the application was favorably reviewed and that we were placed on the, uh, placed first on the standby list. So we're currently working with the state on that application. <clears throat> As part of that grant, there is a stormwater resource plan requirement. So a stormwater resource plan is a condition of receiving grant funds for stormwater and dry weather runoff projects. Um, and this comes from the water code and is implemented uh, because from any bond approved by voters after January, 2014. So the Division of Water Quality developed uh, stormwater resource plan guidelines consistent with the water code provisions enacted by Senate Bill 985. And in these guidelines, there is a self-certification checklist, which there's just a, a screen capture of what that looks like. And these help guide um, local agencies and people um, preparing the stormwater resource plan to make sure that it is consistent with the water code and the state water board guidelines. So why is the stormwater resource plan important? Well, the key here for this type of plan is that it focuses on being a watershed based plan. Um, traditional approaches to stormwater, like we've been talking about, typically include maybe limited treatment prior to the storm drain entering the storm or the stormwater entering the storm drain system and ultimately the receiving water bodies. Uh, the focus of a stormwater resource plan is to focus on the natural hydrology within the existing, lands, the existing landscapes in order to increase stormwater capture and use and really manage stormwater as a resource and not something to just treat and discharge into our receiving water bodies. So a stormwater resource plan encourages multiple benefit projects and it also incorporates the broader water management goals of the Integrated Regional Water Management Plan, the IRWMP, which in the city of Hollister's case is the Pajaro River Watershed IRWMP. 
So moving forward with the grant application, uh, we started to prepare the stormwater resource plan. In this case, it was the Greater Hollister Area Stormwater Resource Plan. <clears throat> so organization of this plan, um, this graphic here really outlines each of the chapters of the plan. Um, and these are straight from the State Water Board guidelines. So we have the different uh, planning objectives, the watershed characteristics, um, water quality compliance issues, which is just a summary kind of what Carrie was talking about with the fecal coliform, the sediment. Um, we identify the different stormwater projects, have an implementation strategy schedule, and uh, talk about what we're doing here today, community education, public outreach. Um, so the city of Hollister, it's important to kind of get a, a broad picture. City of Hollister is within the Pajaro River watershed which spans the four, four counties and four water districts shown on this slide. Um, the stormwater resource plan guidelines are specific that the plan's boundaries should not just be based on city limits or political boundaries, but it really should um, encompass uh, an accepted watershed delineation. Um, oftentimes uh, the state encourages the use of the US Geologic Survey or USGS, they have accepted watershed delineations. So that is what um, we ended up doing for the Greater Hollister Area Stormwater Resource Plan boundary. Uh, they're based on eight different USGS um, watershed delineations, which are all listed on this slide. Um, so really starting with the city of Hollister and working outwards, we encompass each of these watersheds because they are all um, affected by the city of Hollister and tributary to the Pajaro River. And also on this exhibit, we note the South Santa Clara Stormwater Resource Plan, Santa Cruz County and Greater Monterey County Stormwater Resource Plans. So we really wanted to highlight agency collaboration. The city of Hollister is the submitting agency for when this plan gets submitted to the State Water Board. Um, but we wanted to highlight that this has been a collaborative effort with city of San Juan Batista, San Benito County, San Benito County Water District and Pajaro River Watershed Flood Prevention Authority. <clears throat> so for the identification of each of the stormwater projects, really back to focusing on that watershed based planning approach in order to find projects that not only address water quality concerns, but also might have a flood control benefit, um, a water supply benefit, a groundwater management benefit, we solicited to the different local uh, participating agencies to help identify stormwater, dry weather runoff capture projects um, to include in this plan, and that resulted in eight projects, three programs, four opportunities. Five of the projects are within the city of Hollister and um, directly benefit the San Benito River. And this exhibit shows uh, some of the different project components for the city, the city's identified stormwater uh, projects. So with the identification of the projects comes the benefits analysis. Um, each project was broken down into a quantifiable metric, which is shown in the red table. Um, using results from the stormwater modeling that had previously been done, we looked at several other studies that had um, different hydrology and modeling results. And there's also uh, multiple benefits. This gray table is straight from the stormwater resource plan guideline published by the State Water Board. It breaks down the categories into water quality, water supply, flood management, environmental, and community, and those are broken down into main and additional benefits. So with that benefits analysis comes the prioritization of the different projects. Um, if grant funding was secured, the project received 10 points. If the project was located on publicly owned lands, the project received 15 points quantitative metrics for multiple benefits analysis too. Um, and there was a total possible score of 100 points. And this here is the breakdown of our project prioritization table with each of those eight projects. Um, there's different categories and um, metrics on how the points were assigned. Um, and I'm gonna go through each of these projects here briefly. Um, but it's really important to note that with this stormwater resource plan, just the fact that these projects are identified in this plan, like I mentioned before, makes them eligible to receive that grant funding, regardless of their prioritization on this table. So moving forward with um, an overview of all the projects that were identified in the Greater Hollister Area Stormwater 
resource plan. We have the industrial wastewater treatment plant upgrades that were scored um, the highest priority based on, we have pollutant load reductions to San Benito River. We have the benefits to water supply through the infiltration of the percolation ponds, um, environmental benefits and community benefits in the upstream watershed area that's actually has portions uh, designated as disadvantaged communities. The next project is the Soap Lake Floodplain Preservation Project. This project was identified the, by the Pajaro River Watershed Flood Prevention Authority. Um, and this is based on flood risk reduction project for the lower Pajaro River. Um, it's included in this plan to control flooding in the downstream disadvantaged communities of Watsonville and Pajaro. Um, and it does this by maintaining the existing environmental habitat through the purchase of conservation easements. Next up is the Pacheco Reservoir expansion. Now this project was ad identified in the Santa Clara County Stormwater Resource Plan, um, but it was also important for us to note in the Greater Hollister Area Stormwater Resource Plan because this project directly benefits the Pacheco Creek, which the Lower Pacheco Creek has portions in San Benito County and is within our Greater Hollister Area Stormwater Resource Plan boundary. So uh, this project, by boosting the operational storage capacity from 5,500 acre feet to 140,000 acre feet, um, it, is, it has the ability to reduce peak flows in Pacheco Creek by 60% and also stabilize the drying of downstream wetlands um, in order to improve water quality and, as we mentioned, fish, fish habitat. The next project is the San Juan Batista Wastewater Treatment Plant Project regionalization with the City of Hollister Regional Domestic Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, this project was identified based on water quality benefits of reducing pollutant loads to San Juan Creek, which is tributary to San Benito River. Um, and this project reroutes wastewater flows to the city's regional domestic wastewater treatment plant where it can be used as recycled water or for infiltration. Now this project, Bridge Road Trash Capture, as I mentioned before, this was the grant fund project um, in the city's largest watershed to San Benito River. We've talked about the trash flow capture systems prior um, to San Benito River, and, and this was identified as the largest watershed. So this project, like we mentioned, would um, capture those trash and debris of five millimeters or greater. So this really would reduce a lot of the pollutant loading that is seen in San Benito River. Next, we have the Nash Road Diversion, and I'm going to go ahead and tag on the San Benito Street Diversion, too, um, because they're very similar. These were both identified as upstream diversions needed if um, needed to divert stormwater to the industrial wastewater treatment plant. So this just has to do with existing stormwater flows, and instead of getting sent directly to San Benito River, where these projects are proposing to get sent to the industrial wastewater treatment plant for infiltration instead of sending that untreated water to San Benito River. The last project is Powell Street Underground Detention Project. This was identified in the city's storm drain master plan. Um, and this project was identified to provide flood protection in this intersection in this area. And it has the potential to improve water quality if designed with a stormwater infiltration element. So those, those were a, a brief overview of the projects that um, were identified in the stormwater resource plan. The next steps for this process is to submit this plan to the state water board for concurrence with the water code. Um, once we receive con concurrence and approval with the water board, we will present to city council for adoption of the stormwater resource plan. Um, and finally, the last step is submit to submit to the Regional Water Management Group for incorporation into the Pajaro River Watershed IRWMP. So that's a brief overview of the Greater Hollister Area Stormwater Resource Plan, and that's actually our conclusion to the stormwater presentation as well. I can take questions specifically on stormwater resource plan, and Carrie can come up here too. If there's more. I'm sure there's, there's lots of questions. <laughs> yep. We can go back to your question regarding Bridge Road if you want, would like. Okay. Do you want me to go yeah, back? Yeah, go back to that that uh, slide. 
So is that what that square building is? Yeah. So, so uh, it, if you were to go out to Bridge Road, so the outfall is that little square, black square at the very end of that line. That is your current outfall. Mm -hmm. uh, this line is 48, in, no, 60. In. The storm drain line? The storm drain line, the existing storm drain line. 42. 42, 42 inch. So it's a, it's a pretty large storm drain. Um, and again, this is the largest outfall. I, I don't know what the flow is exactly in CFS, um, but it is going to require four diversion structures. So those circles, so basically if you, the way you understand this is it, it's gonna go into that first square. So the black line and the green line are your storm drains. The water's gonna flow from right to left and it's gonna go into that first square. That first square is then going to take the low flows, the ones that we have to treat, the, the trash capture, which is the one year, one hour storm, it's going to send it to those other two rectangular boxes. From there, it is going to then go into those four circle box, the four circles. Those four circles are the full, four, full capture systems. That's where all the trash is going to create. Those box, those circles are eight feet, yeah. so eight feet in diameter. So you have four eight foot diameter manholes that are going to be underneath the street. They actually, I think they're 12 actually based on that model. Yeah. That, 12 feet. So, so this is a significant project. And this is why when we went after the grant funding is this project is, is very expensive. And it is one that the city has to do because of the trash compliance. So this is something that the city is mandated to do by the end of 2020. I believe it was 2030. 2030. Mm -hmm. Okay. So by the end of 2030, this project has to be in place. It is right now four point four and a half million dollars in today's dollars is what we've estimated the cost of this project to be completed. So what we have, we, when we worked with the city is we started working on the industrial wastewater treatment plant. There is a nexus in stormwater compliance and stormwater uh, treatment that we figured out that the Prop 1 grant was, would allow for us to use the industrial wastewater treatment plant project, which is also a full capture system and an environmental need, um, and one to help existing city infrastructure and the cleaning of the water. We'll use that for matching funds, and we will then apply for grant funds for this one. So we have not started design on this because we cannot ask for grant funds reimbursement of anything that we've already spent. So we have to wait until we are awarded the grant before we can start design on this project. We've already done environmental on the project. We've got environmental clearance in the mitigated neg deck. We've, the council has already seen that come through. Um, it was done at the same time as the industrial wastewater treatment plant project. And we are just waiting for the state to give final approval on the grant. As Andrea said, we are first on the standby list we had to wait for the state to determine whether or not they had additional funds available um, from the grant process in order to award the additional funds to the city. And so there, when we talked to them back in March, they said the likelihood is, is that the, the funds will be made available, but we have to wait until the next budget, fiscal year budget and understand where the funds are coming from. The state, the state has subsequently already reached out to, to myself and Brett um, to talk about the, 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 the project itself. We've had to resubmit some technical data. We've had, and they are just so backed up between their round one print, uh, prop one grants that are all ending right now and the prop two applications and all the, the contracts and everything else, they're just backed up. So we're just waiting on them to get approval for it. Um, I truly do. I'm probably 95% positive that the state, the city is going to get that four and a half million dollars, which will be fantastic. So it is a large project. This is just a conceptual design. Believe me, the final design is probably going to be very different. We don't know where the utilities are in the road. We, we're going to have to design around a lot of infrastructure there. So we're, you know, this is just a conceptual layout at this point. So just one other question, uh, the, uh, so it's a trash capture. How do we know when to go empty it? The city will, the city at a minimum will go and inspect it before the rainy season. And then after any major storm, they'll probably after first flush, they'll go out and, and look sure. at it. It'll have access manhole ports that they'll be able to go out and they'll bring their pumper truck out and, and suck all of it out. Thank you.
Thank you. Any other questions? Councilmember Burns, do you have any questions? I do, Mayor. Thank you. So um, you answered partially my, my question, which was going to be what is a, on the standby list? And what I'm hearing you say is there's a reasonable assurance that we're going to be awarded the grant funding. Did I see that the city also had to have uh, a matching funds? Did I, did I see that correctly? Correct. For the Prop 1 grant, it is requires, it's, it's a one-to-one -one match. So every dollar of grant funds, you have to have, the city has to have spent one dollar of matching funds. So the industrial wastewater treatment plant project is your matching funds. So that project, all of those upgrades are the, are the matching funds. We also had, we also used the 4th Street project, uh, the stormwater improvements that occurred at the 4th Street project those projects, uh, that money is also being used as part of the matching funds for the, the stormwater grant. So that okay. seven is not all, it's matching funds. It's not all the industrial wastewater treatment plant. We also use, there's administrative matching funds. Uh, we used uh, actually, I believe the city's um, CCTV, sorry. <laughs> we, uh, I used the CCTV camera and the um, pumper truck, some, some of the maintenance facilities. We use those as ma maintenance funds as well, or uh, matching funds. Okay. So, so then it's not like we need to come up with another four plus million dollars. It sounds like we've already spent that money for work that's been done that will be uh, allowed to be used in lieu of the uh, matching funds. Am, am I hearing that correctly? Uh, yes, the, the city has gone through the process. You have not technically spent the funds. You have not approved the industrial wastewater project for construction at this point. The city that will still have to come back for city council approval wants to go out to bid and to approve the construction contract. So in, in, in essence, yes, the city is moving forward with the project, but the city at any time obviously could still pull the project as well. Okay. Is, is there anything else we can do to strengthen our, our, our probability of receiving the grant funding? Really, at this point, the project is as strong as it possibly can be. Um, the, imp, the One of the elements that we will have to get is we have to get the stormwater resource plan submitted to the state. One of the requirements of the grant is that that stormwater resource plan must be submitted to the state within three months of notice of award. So we've actually had some opportunity since we did not get awarded in January like the others did. We actually had time to strengthen the stormwater resource plan, make it more regionalized, um, work with the Pajaro uh, River uh, Flood Management Group, work with the County San Benito Water District, um, San Juan Batista, and we've made a better stormwater resource plan because we've had more time. Um, they all were in support of us getting it in if we had been awarded earlier, but um, not actually being awarded the, the grant right off the bat uh, allowed us some opportunity to strengthen that report to where when we do submit it to the state, we're hoping that the, the comments that we receive back are minimal because it is a very regionalized plan. Also, Councilmember Burnton, Kitty can kind of correct me. It was one of those things when we talked to them, they said that we can't, they couldn't guarantee us that we were going to get the funds but that we were going to get the funds pretty much. So what I'm hearing you say is we're going to get the funds. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, and, and I presume then we're on track with once we receive notice of award that we will hit that three months or sooner a time deadline. Correct. The, the report is done. The Pajaro flood management working group or flood management group has already approved the report um, which is, uh, they are the, one of the major contributors to it. We are going to be presenting the report also to San Juan Batista and the county here shortly. Uh, the city, we really just need, um, we wanted to do this workshop and then we, were, we wanted authorization from the city to have us send it to the state for a uh, review of it. Once we get their comments and once they approve it, we will back bring it back. Since you are the submitting agency, we will bring it back to city council for formal adoption. But okay. yes, we are in track. We are on track, absolutely, for submitting it within that three months. Okay. And, and uh, Mr. Miller, uh, do you forecast the need for any additional staffing as a result of uh, an award of this grant? Yeah, we'll probably need, I'm looking at Henry, he's shaking his head, yes, we need staffing. But yeah, it'll be like for the 
back trucks that need to suck out this tr trash and to monitor the lines. Okay, it'd be, it'd be helpful maybe um, to have a better understanding of what that looks like as well moving forward. And I don't know if three months is a reasonable target for that, but um, at some point moving forward, I think we need to have that conversation. And I would argue relatively soon, but relative being three months or in that time frame, and I'll defer to you for your judgment in that regard. Also wanted to speak for just a moment on the watershed plan. And, and I, I, I philosophically, I find myself aligning with the mayor in this case where, where um, I am not a huge advocate for the in lieu of fee plan or program. Um, I understand that in, in, in the case of the uh, one commercial project that it was a necessary uh, uh, response, but um, I'm wondering if there is some language specific to the plan that we're gonna submit um, if we need to, I, I don't know if what the right words are, but but a last option in my mind would be the in lieu fee program because I do think we get some compromised projects that might be better placed in other spots or not uh, developed uh, at all. And so I don't know to be clear with the development community if that kind of language would be appropriate in a plan or just a generic. Uh, discussion of it in the plan. And so I just, I trust in your judgment as the uh, professionals to, to make that call, but I wanted to push that out. So let me make sure that everybody is clear. The watershed plan and the in lieu fee are completely two separate administrative issues. The watershed plan is a requirement that the regional board brings forward to us as an alternative compliance. It is a plan that the regional board is going to approve. The city on how they implement the watershed plan is a completely different transaction. You have the plan approved by the regional board. The regional board is giving you the authority as the permitting agency to either allow development to utilize the watershed plan for alternative compliance or to continue to maintain PCR requirements per the original regional board requirements. It does not in any way require you once you've approved the watershed plan, give full right to the development to be able to use that watershed plan. That is still the purview of staff and council to authorize the use of the watershed plan for PCR requirements. It's just giving you an alternative option. So whether or not the city implements an in lieu fee is completely at the sole discretion of the city council. How you want to pay for it how, how you want development to pay for it, that is up to the city council in the future. Uh, the regional board has absolutely no say or desire to get involved in that. The only thing they can, are concerned with is that the PCR requirements are being implemented, whether or not at the regional facility or on site, they don't care if you have a watershed plan as long as those PCR requirements are being implemented. Thanks. I appreciate the clarification. And I like your language at the sole discretion of the city council, I think. And I think that's important to uh, express as well, because we all know that um, sometimes when people see things, um, they, they think because it's not uh, restricted, it's permitted and um, or it's permissive. And so I, I really would like to see some clear and consistent language uh, to, to show that it's it's not an entitlement. It's an alternative of uh, last resource, as far as I view it, based on what I've heard you said at this point. So uh, thank you for your clarity. I appreciate it. Thanks for your response. I think you had a great presentation. I'm, I'm not smart in this area, but I'm a little smarter today than I was yesterday. And I, I thank you for that. Mayor, that concludes my questions and comments. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, any other questions from council over this side? Just a real if, quick before comment. I'm going to mic. Go ahead, Mr. President. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just wanted to thank you because every time I came up with the question, you guys just went right ahead and answered it. So it's like, I feel kind of quiet, but it was a very, I loved it. it. You answered all the questions. So kept me quiet. Thanks. Thank you. Councilmember Resendez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, just a couple quick comments. Um, I want to get back to, if I can find out what's going on with the CIPs. It's been 10 years. I think maybe they things have changed since then. I think we should go back and we should, just analyze them and make sure that we still need to do those. And if so, 
which ones should we prioritize or not, and then start bringing those to the council. And then the second thing I would like to, if I don't know if this is the appropriate time, Mr. Mayor, to ask if we agendize, um, to asking the county, I think we can take action as the city council to ask the county to please follow the MSR4 requirement. Is that what it's called? MS4 requirements, yes. So I just think if we can at least take action, we can't require them, but I think it would say something for us to agendize that and to come up as a council and ask them to please follow that requirement. Ultimately, we're building in the county someday, it's going to be annexed in, and it's best that we, again, look at this as a regional problem <clears throat> and not just what's within our jurisdiction because it affects mm -hmm. everybody, right? Um, and like everybody else said, thanks. This was very informative, very clear, concise to the point. These things can be very overwhelming. I don't know if it's because of the years that I've been up here, I'm following along, <laughs> but Good. you guys did a fantastic job, Carrie. So my hat's off to you and thank you so much for this presentation. You're welcome. Um, let me just a couple of things regarding the CIPs. Um, it is good to always bring back master plans um, every so often uh, based on new development, changes in land use and so forth. Stormwater one is actually the one that I would say is the least priority of, of doing updates. We've been doing updates on the regulatory side. So we've been keeping up and helping and assisting on the MS4 and, um, and so forth. And so we've helping on that side of it. Um, really, your roads haven't changed. Um, and so that, that is what in your stormwater infrastructure, since we haven't changed anything, you know, on sewer and water that's being driven by development and increased capacity and lower usage and stuff, uh, hydrology doesn't really change. So the pro the projects that we identify 10 years ago are likely going to be the exact same projects that we would identify if we were to update the storm drain master plan. Um, priorities might slightly shift, but they're all high priority projects. And so, yes, they should be funded. They should be identified the biggest challenge with stormwater projects, and this is not just in your city, it is in all municipalities, stormwater is an under, underfunded infrastructure. It does not have its own dedicated fund like water and sewer do. And so you are constantly trying to pull that money from the general fund um, and, and so forth. And so it is competing against your fire, your, your streets, your, you know, it is competing against all of these other resources. And because it is below ground and because stormwater only happens when people only think about it when it starts to rain. It is not thought about all the time. And so stormwater is underfunded. Your operations staff has a lot to work on year round. Um, the operations crew have storm drains that need to be maintained and cleaned because if you don't have the capacity in those storm drains, if the sediment gets in there, you don't have the capacity that increases the potential for flooding. So operations and maintenance needs needs funding. And I'm, I, I, you know, this is just stuff that as the city council, you drive where your funds are going and infrastructure, your operations and maintenance, CCTV, um, staffing availability. Those are all high priority things that unfortunately oftentimes get pushed to the side. So that's why the, the, the importance of this presentation is to really show you how much work and effort your staff has to do on an annual basis to comply with the Regional Water Quality Control Board requirements, which is an unfunded mandate. And that's the, that's the hard part about this, is it is all unfunded mandates that you have to comply with. So, that I, so in terms of bringing back a storm drain master plan, really the idea is just, just to look at that storm drain master plan and identify and look at where those capital improvement projects, look at the timing of where your road projects are and see if you can combine them to make them cheaper. And I, I, I have several questions, so we're not going to be out of here for another hour. <laughs> but did you have a comment? Yeah, real quick. Uh, Mark, Mark uh, our uh, acting city engineer, has been working on laying, doing basically layover of our water projects, our sewer projects, and our road projects to try to maximize all those CIPs so that we do truly get uh, a good bang for our buck. Absolutely. And now I get to start. <laughs> and I think I, I do want to answer or uh, comment on a few things. Mr. Burns uh, talked about making sure the uh, it's the last alternative. And I think it's so critically important because, again, from what I've seen in the past was, well, let's just do this for this developer and then we'll worry about it later. And it really ended up hurting us as a community. Absolutely. And we get it if there's absolutely no alternative and this project has to happen because maybe it is a government facility that needs to be implemented. It's really important that we're clear on that. So it's not the first alternative of, oh, well, here's some dollars and we'll wink, wink, and well, everybody's happy. Yep. Can't do that. 
Uh, you, you mentioned unfunded and early in the conversation, well, why had these things happen? And that was exactly it. It was like, well, we don't have the money. Let's worry about it some other time. Mm -hmm. The problem with infrastructure is you, you cannot put it off because it will get you someday. And that hundred year storm, did we get the answer on that, by the way? 96, 97 storms. These are, um, okay, these are really important <laughs> things. And I, this is why I get so excited when we, most people fall asleep when you talk infrastructure, I get really excited with it. You know, we talk about 20 million towards the roads, you know, 40, $50 million towards infrastructure, sewer, storm, water. It's, we need to catch up. So I'm excited about this. I'm excited about that overlay that's coming, but I still have a lot more questions here. Sure. You talked about pond two in a storm, water coming in and then releasing back to the river. Correct. And you're releasing back after a treatment or what oh. exactly is happening that you're uh, so, at that point releasing back? Let me get to a picture of the, the facility. Okay, so, so remember for the trash capture, which is a one year, one hour storm and the PCR requirements, which is an 85th percentile. Hold you up for sure. a second. Are we, aren't we putting something there also a, uh, the, to capture the trash before yes. at the storm drain? Yes, at, yes. Apricot. at, yeah. at, at Apricot, um, at, as well, I believe at South street as well, we will have a full capture system to collect trash and, and everything five millimeters, uh, um, before it enters pond two, Correct. so that we do not have trash going into pond two and then blowing out and or getting pond three or pond matter. three or anywhere, you know, in the facility. So yes, we will have a full capture system that will collect five millimeters. And that one's actually going to be kind of cool because we actually, that one, your river trail project is going to be right next to it. And we are actually not doing the same facility as we're doing at uh, the bridge road, but we actually, um, I believe we've settled on, and don't quote me on this because it's been a while actually since I've looked at the plan set, but I believe we will be able to, you might be able to view inside to be able to see how much trash comes out of it. I don't know for sure, but that's, I, I believe that's what we were, we were targeting to begin with. And I don't know if we've changed that. So we're trying to make public education to show what, how much trash comes down into the collection system. So water is going to go through that full capture system and then it is going to be diverted into pond two, okay? We are collecting, so that is the low storms, the small storms. Those small storms are gonna flow directly into pond two and it's the storms that were required to capture for the 85th percentile storm, as well as the one year, one at one, our one year storm, which is the trash capture and then the 85th percentile is the post construction requirements. So there's slightly different types of storms. It's the volume of water that we have to capture and at what rate we have to capture it. There's, there's calculations that we have to run the hydrology that we have to run in order to size that. Pond two is large enough to capture all of the development and it's, cap it's capable of capturing for the watershed for um, uh, apricot, to, to do the full capture system. So the water's gonna go into pond two. During a 25 year storm or a 75 year storm, a hundred year storm, even a 10 year storm, that water is going to then bypass that diversion structure and it is gonna continue to flow out to San Benito River, okay? So we are not going to send that to pond two. Pond two does not have the capacity to handle that side storm. But that size storm is not what is required by the city to have to treat or capture. That size storm we want in the river, we want to provide water in the, for the habitat right. and send it downstream. That is the clean water that we want to go into the river. Okay, so in that case, you have a structure, it meets that height and it's gonna start flowing over into the river. Mm -hmm. Pond three at that point can't keep up. Are you pumping from pond three to two? So the pump station that is in pond two has the ability to, there is a, there is a diversion structure that is on the Southeast corner of pond three that will flow the water either into pond three or into the ponds four, five, and six. Okay. That's if you're pumping from pond two. Pond Three, the South Street, South Street's watershed is very small. It is actually a very tiny watershed. 
So pawn three has the capacity to be able to take, it always has, it, it has the ability to take the storm water. We are beefing up the connection between pawn three and pawn four so that if we do get a hundred year storm or something of you know magnitude of that watershed, it can flow into the other um, three ponds, percolation ponds, so that we have adequate capacity. Or so we we've run through, we've run through, we cannot get it back into pond two. So we have run through the calculations, a water balance calculation to ensure that the that there is significant sufficient capacity in the percolation basins to handle the storms that we're talking about. And we can continue to maintain pond two if we get a huge storm we can hold the water in pond two and let it overflow. We are, we're doing a concrete spillway from pond two back over to the river so that if pond two overflows, we don't want that flowing into pond one. We, the, that's the last thing that we can. We, we cannot, in a, we cannot um, mingle stormwater and wastewater because then automatically it becomes wastewater, wastewater into the river, not a good thing, okay? So we are going to, we have, we're doing a concrete spillway that allows water from pond two to overflow back to the river in a huge storm. Everything is, you know, going haywire. We can flow the water back over to uh, the river and not inundate pond one. Perfect. Thank you. The reason I'm asking these questions is we've had conversations in the past year about, we lost our big fishing area here and I'm sure you know about that whole deal. There's talk, how do we turn some of these ponds into a fishing area mm -hmm. for our community to make the best use out of this? Yep. So that's, I always want you to keep that in your mind so we can get there sooner rather than later. So and, our community can come around and say, well, this is just awesome. Look at this. And uh, finish our walking trail around it. So if you could keep that in mind when you're doing some of these designs so we can use, you know, maybe use four and six. Unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, ponds three, four, five, and six, we cannot convert them into fishing ponds. Um, pond two, we are trying to maintain a level within the pond so that we can have a floating aerator island in there. We could have habitat in there. The birds, you know, we know that it's a bird sanctuary. That'll work in there. For right now. I'm That's, perfectly happy with that. Yeah. And so we are trying to. Our biggest concern with that is you go into three years of drought like we are right now, we cannot actually refill that basin. And so we do have some operational concerns about those floating islands um, when and during a drought and whether or not they're going to cause more operational problems and concerns for staff versus I, we absolutely know what the environmental benefits are, the, the habitat that they can create the, you know, the, what the last thing I want to do is, is stock that pond full of fish and then the pond dry out. We have extra water for that problem. <laughs> we, we had an answer for that too. So, so and that's, I do want you, and I'm, I'm being serious about this. Yeah. That's why I want you to think about this so we can get there. And that's, and we've later. definitely um, had those uh, discussions to allow for pond, but we have to have adequate capacity in pond to, to be able to handle the storm events and the multiple storms that come in at a time during a rain, rainy season. And then on the uh, drought side, we have to understand and what is it going to do during a drought Perfect. side? So we'll talk about that and get that going. Okay. City manager, we, we talked about some of the funds here that were the grants were winning. Some of these things, could they be considered emergency? So we can maybe get the low interest loans. Well, low interest loans are always available. You can go through California Infrastructure that's, Economic that's Development right. yeah. Bank. Yeah. Those don't have to be emergencies to do. Them. Well, we uh, can look at some of sure. this. We're going to see, see what we can do to get some of those dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's. I think what you have here, and I, I'm. I, I say this all the time to everyone. I'm so excited to be working with this council because they're all focused on getting these things done. And I think in the past it was like, let's just put it off, put it off. Now it's. Let's do this. Let's get this this work done. So I really want to make sure we're doing everything we can to get the funding we need to get these things done. When you come back, and now I'm going to go into the river a bit. We have our our section in the city, and then we have um, just past the bridge at the bridge and past this county. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Council Member Perez, you were kind of leading towards the uh, conversation about the amount of trash that keeps getting put out there. What enforcement mechanisms do we have with this state to help us um, 
I know the county's trying to do their part now, but some of the property owners that are allowing access in the dumping to happen is that, and I think we have that happen in on our side, but I think some of that area is privately owned too. To, to, well, I know we, we own it from Apricot to the bridge. Correct. On our side. So, you know, but people are getting access through some of these other properties and then dumping on ours. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Fire has been working with them, uh, with the, the quarry and we're, we're trying to get those accesses closed and off. Let's make sure we're clear on whatever that fine is. So we're, uh, you know, people are running trucks in there and, you know, they're having Correct. fun and, oh, while we're here, let's just dump our trash cans Correct. into um, it. Let's make sure that's being taken care of. Go ahead, sir. Just real quick on, on that topic. Um, I know there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a lot of tires that are being dumped and those are not from someone's backyard, someone no. dumping. Yeah. And so do we have anything in place with the reward system, um, anonymous tip line to for dumpers, and and I mean because I've I've for many years I've taken my dogs down there doing homeless ministries and stuff. Yeah, it's like the um, tires are. It's I go down there and I don't know if you guys remember that old commercial, the Indian going down the stream, seeing all the yeah. trash, and that one tear falls. Correct. That's how I feel when I go down there because that's one of our, our local businesses that's dumping something or maybe not a local business, but it's a business that's dumping that stuff. Doing something. Yeah. We yeah. still have we tip, so which is an anonymous fine and there's an award, well, reward with that. Let's find out what that maximum fine is that we can implement probably a thousand dollars. I don't know if we have it on our books or not, but we need to make sure have and it. convince the County to do the same thing because we just can't, you make a great point. One year we cleaned it up. We hired a company to come clean it up. By the next year, it looked exactly the same. And then people will blame certain groups. But no, it's it's a business or people doing it knowingly. So it's a really sad situation. So I have an answer for you on your 95. I, I want to hear it. I'm done then if you have an answer. <laughs> so uh, we don't have it for specifically for Hollister, but for the Salinas area, 95 was a 100-year flood. Okay. That's, so that's what close we, enough that's what it where it, it, it was probably close to a hundred year, uh, here in well, it, as well. it was about to take out the bridge. I mean, yep. that's how high the water was. So I figured it yep. probably was a hundred year. So we're probably coming up on the 200 year now, um, the way things are. I want to go now to, uh, street sweeping. Yes. We know a lot of the, and Mr. Burns made a comment about it. A lot of the trash comes because of the lack of street sweeping. We have an issue here where nobody wants to move their cars and Mr. Burns and I are on a new committee can talk about this, that street sweepers just drive down the center of the street, but we know the trash is there at the curb. Mm -hmm. Is there any other, um, we're, we'll work our own ordinance here, but is there any other help or any other, um, maybe to get that, that additional sweeper so we have it for backup? Um, any other state rules with this that can help us? Not that so, I'm aware of. So people understand because when we go implement people, oh, you're just harassing us. No, we're not. We're just trying to keep our city clean. So if you know of anything like that, please help us. Again, it comes through public education, public outreach. Um, it's sending those flyers. It's informing them. Most people don't put, the, they don't get the nexus. They don't understand what the street sweeping is for yeah. and why it benefits the creeks and the rivers and the habitat and, and the environment. They just think it's something that the city is pestering them about. Right. It's the same thing with the dog, you know, picking up your dog poop. It, it It's uh, dumping chemicals down the storm drain system. They don't understand because you physically cannot see the connection of the storm drain to the outfall. They don't understand that connection. And most people are just not educated enough to know that. And I don't mean it from an educated, they've not been educated through their, their, um, you know, life to understand the connection between the storm drain gutter and the outfall kids, 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 kids are a major impact to education. We have um, significant education outreach programs at the youth level. And believe me, kids bring it home and teach the parents. 
they are the number one supporter of your future is the kids environment. And so I would highly recommend, I know several outreach companies that will create kid programs for different age groups that will come into the system and teach you about wastewater and recycling water and stormwater compliance that, and when you educate the youth, they educate their parents and they are the future and they will change their habits. Yeah. So it's, those are different things that you can invest money in over time. And you actually, you far more get more impact with reaching out to your youth than you do very stubborn adults. Very, very good point. The uh, last question I had for you was the Powell street project. Yes. So that is a big project. Um, Oh, I think that I'm going the wrong direction. From, that <laughs> Sorry. flows from where? Which direction? What are we, where we can bring that water in from? What line? Um, it looks like it's coming down South 7th Street. Andrea? It's heading west, going down. Yeah, yeah, it's I heading see west. Capturing that line. Um, the question I was going to ask you with this is I'm seeing a lot of conversation. Mark, I think we've had this conversation about the um you're seeing communities now using permeable mm -hmm. pavers or concrete along the curb lines digging down first cutting four foot sections out down the line pulling out a lot of the, the dirt putting sand or different mm -hmm. materials and then coming back and um paving or absolutely but that what kind of cost is that and what you know with the older neighborhoods we can't really go back and change things but we can implement newer mm -hmm. ideas yep have we looked at that as far as cost and how much of an impact would that have to be doing as we're moving forward on repaving some of these older streets or doing the some of the projects changing water lines that we can maybe do projects like this that would really help quite a bit and maybe at the end of the day it, it comes out a little cheaper than um doing a whole pond there so, so, um, there are, and this is an underground detention. This I, is I know it's an yeah, underground. So. That's why I know it's very, I've seen them on many, many yep. of construction sites and I think they're very cool, but I know they're very costly. So, yeah. So this one is specific because it's flood management. It means you've got a localized central system, which, and you don't have, um, adequate storm drain capacity there, or there's not even a storm drain in that line. No, that the blue line says it is. So that there's not adequate capacity there and it's a localized drainage. Um, to be honest, I don't remember exactly the details of why we identified that project. Um, but low impact development is definitely options that the city can always explore permeable pavers, uh, permeable concrete, um, you know, drainage swales, water quality benefits. Those are all different things that the city can investigate as opportunities for uh, water quality for percolation into the storm drain basin. The more you percolate into the groundwater basin, the better off your groundwater basin is instead of sending it out to the river and out to the ocean, you know, um, to Monterey Bay and to, to uh, the, the wetlands um, where it gets lost to the ocean. So any water that you can retain on site is great. One thing that I hesitate though, is that storm water, water and pavement don't mix. Pavement doesn't like water. So you do have to be, it has to be an engineered design in making sure that you, and you don't want water around foundations, you know, so there are definitely limitations on where right. you can and yeah. cannot do some of these. Yeah, no, these, these are being done every many, mm -hmm. many places now. So I know there's a lot of designs out there. I just want to have that conversation. What kind of impact does it have? It has, it has a lot of impact for um, our plan. So it does. Yeah. And you can do, you know, in these commercial development projects, you can do permeable pavers. You can do the, the permeable concrete. They are more expensive than your traditional asphalt laid parking lot. Um, you can have the drainage swells, uh, you know, we're, we're training up our engineers to think more environmentally. Um, we're not to maximize all the asphalt to drainage and, you know, put them into drainage swells. With that though, there comes operations and maintenance, having to maintain the vegetation. There's there's pros and cons to everything and you just got to understand the differences between Absolutely. it. But again, that makes it look pretty, right? It does. It's done right and it, it looks pretty and we're, Absolutely. we're problem solving. So that was my last question. I appreciate your presentation today, all of you.
Go ahead, Mr. Perez. Um, actually, can you describe or tell me what an underground detention and we're not going to lose our baseball field, right? No. So underground is actually you will for a while. <laughs> <laughs> you will for a while during construction. No, underground detention basins are going to be basins that are actually under the ground. You build right on top of it. Um, and basically the water will go in, sorry, um, the water will go into the basin. It'll be stored there for a temporary period. It might have the ability to percolate into the ground. Um, when it gets certain level, it will then continue to flow out and down the street back into the collection system. And, um, and that would be down South street, um, to that, would you call it, it was a low, um, where it connects to the, uh, to the ponds. This seventh street, I'm not sure if that goes to the industrial wastewater treatment plant or if that goes to bridge. I believe that that one goes to bridge road outfall. Oh, okay. So South street would go down to South street, South street, a certain portion of South street goes to the industrial wastewater treatment plant. A a certain portion of South street goes up to bridge. Okay. Like I said, the, the South, the industrial wastewater treatment plant watershed on South street is actually very small. It's not very large at all. All right. Thank you. Okay. And those, when they do that, those huge pipes it, lined up next to each other and then yep, you bury them and go through a whole yeah. system and get, we, finds its way out. We just constructed one in Pacific Grove, um, an underground detention basin uh, in Pacific Grove and it's underneath the golf course. It's underneath the tee box. And so it's all, it's all kept into the the, the system itself, it doesn't just flow out into the... Correct. Okay. It's basically, think of, um, you can have them in pipes, you can have them in a tank, uh, a concrete tank. Okay. Uh, there's different there's different construction types that you can, you can build. And awesome. uh, it goes in there and depending on how the soils are and what the purpose of that facility is, you either just fully retain it and then it eventually meters out to the, collect- to the storm drain collection system or you may have the ability to percolate it into, into the ground. It, it depends on the design. Awesome. They're pretty cool. But that I'll say, thank you. Yeah. What, what's nice about it is that you can then construct on top of it. You can utilize it for a, a, you know, a park or a golf course or whatever it might be. You just can't construct a building on top of it. Well, again, thank you for your presentation and your time tonight. It was our I pleasure. Think, again, we all learned a lot of good information. And we're looking forward to all these projects finally happening. So with that, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Very second. Second. Second roll call, please. Councilmember Burns. I'm sorry, did you say Burns? I did. That's you, sir. Yeah, caught me off. I'm, I'm a creature of habit and routine. Yes, please. Sorry, and I, and I winced when I said it. Uh, Council Member Perez? Yes. Vice Mayor Resendez? Yes. Mayor Velasquez? Yes. Motion carries 4 0. Thank you. Thank you all. I know. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.